Okay, that sounds great. All right, so good afternoon, everyone. I'm Tania Wood Luna. I am Heather's assistant for Careers Fire and Fuels. Um, I also teach the cultural use of fire class at University of Idaho here and then oversee NWCG classes as a course facilitator. Uh, today we have a guest, Emily, that's going to introduce herself here in a second. And uh, she's going to give us a presentation on her career in fire and fuels. And then there will be opportunity for questions at the end from me. And I think we have one other person. Maybe we'll see if we have any more. And uh, then we'll go from there. All right. Emily, welcome. Thanks for joining us. Thanks. Great to be here. I'm happy to, to jump in and do this for y'all this week. I, I'm Emily Homan. I am the Fire Learning Network Director, and I work for the Nature Conservancy's North America Fire Team. And I can talk a little bit more about uh, my role and what I do with that team and with the fire networks as we get into it. And then absolutely welcome questions as well. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. And I am on a, a kind of a finicky bandwidth internet. So if at any point uh, this isn't working, please let me know and, and I'll adjust as needed. Sounds good. All right. Uh, so, um, like I said, I'm the Fire Learning Network Director. I have a bachelor's degree in biology from Grand Valley State University in Michigan. It's the third largest university in the state of Michigan. You probably have never heard of it. It is not as famous as the other two big universities there. Uh, I initially started school wanting to be a veterinarian. And around my junior year in college, I got really distracted by natural resources management and got bit by that bug and changed uh, changed my career focus. So when I graduated and I was thinking about going to grad school, I worked for uh, the Nature Conservancy as a seasonal employee very briefly. And that is where I took my first fire courses and did my first prescribed fires, really got bit by the fire bug and never looked back from there. Went on to complete a master's in biology with an emphasis in natural resources management, also from Grand Valley State. And over the last, I actually had to do the math the other day, 16 years in fire now, uh, I have gotten up to Bryn Boss Tape 2 qualification, firing boss, engine boss, baller, FEMO, um, all that good stuff. I have way too many hobbies, most of them outdoors, um, and I currently live in Southwest Colorado, but I grew up in the state of Michigan, and I also worked for six years in Iowa and other parts of the Great Plains. Uh, so the start of my journey, uh, like I said, I, I took my fire courses pretty early, uh, actually just two weeks before I started my first job with the Nature Conservancy and did my first prescribed fire. And I have this distinct memory of telling my parents that I was going to go take this class and having them ask, uh, well, why are you taking that? And, and I explained what 13190 was. And I said, you know, I'm really interested in ecological restoration. I may never be on a fire. I may never be on a burn, but it's good to understand this tool because it's so important in ecological management. And little did I know <laughs> that it would really come to be the focus of my career. So uh, this picture all the way on the left of me sleeping on a pile of hose is my first nap on the fire line. I remember taking 13190 and laughing at the, the 10 and 18s where it says taking a nap on the fire line as a watch out situation. And I thought, who does that? Why would you sleep on the fire line? And my very first wildfire, my very first season in fire I found out why you take a nap on the fire line. And the person who took this picture was my lookout. So we were we were totally legit doing this. <laughs> and I'm sleeping on hose because the ground was more wet than the hose. So that was the drier option. Uh, and then the picture on the right is my first night burn. Uh, this one would have maybe been my second season in fire. And uh, what a cool experience. You know, if you've had a chance to do any night fire operations, it is a very different environment, really spectacular, beautiful, compelling, um, gets everybody excited, right? So it was pretty fun. Um, and I was very fortunate 
to work with really great people at the start of my career. One of those is the gentleman in the center picture there. Uh, this is the same wildfire my first season. That's Rodolfo Zuniga Villegas. He currently works for the Nature Conservancy in uh, Indiana, I believe. Maybe the Illinois program, I always get those confused. Uh, and he's just a fantastic land steward, manager, friend, and fire practitioner. Um, and I really learned a lot from Rodolfo and Jack and Matt and Steve and everybody else I worked with in my first year in fire, who really taught me the importance of ecological management. And uh, we all did fire because we cared about the land. And that really was compelling to me. So, uh, yeah, as so I've been touching on uh, so far, my pathway is, is somewhat similar to a lot of folks in that I started with seasonal jobs and volunteering. I volunteered for the Nature Conservancy before I became a seasonal employee. Uh, it wasn't until I was a seasonal that I started doing prescribed fire. And uh, I had completed my bachelor's degree in biology at that point. Um, went on to start grad school after my first season with TNC and continued to volunteer for them. While I was in grad school, I stepped into an assistant land steward position. So preserve manager um, type position, doing a lot of ecological restoration, prescribed fire, invasive management, that kind of thing. Uh, after about four years and after graduating with my master's, I made a kind of a lateral move out to Western Iowa with the Nature Conservancy, where I managed about 4,000 acres of native prairie. And we had a bison herd on our largest preserve called Broken Cattle Grasslands, just north of Sioux City, Iowa. And there I was able to do kind of the holy grail of prairie management, which is bison grazing and prescribed fire on native prairie. Uh, so we used a patch burn grazing model there that uh, used fire to change the grazing intensity and rotational patterns of the bison grazing. And we had the bison for the prairie. Um, my supervisor out there always said, we don't have the prairie for the bison, we have the bison for the prairie, because grazing is such an important part of prairie management. So it was a really holistic approach to ecosystem management there. Uh, from there, I took a, a pretty hard turn in my career, and I went to be the executive director of a small nonprofit that's based in southern Colorado and northern New Mexico called the Chamo Peak Land Alliance. And that nonprofit was focused on helping private landowners with a really wide range of land management type activities. I stayed in touch with FIRE through this, kept working toward my burn boss qualification, uh, was able to achieve that kind of mostly on my own time when I was the executive director of this nonprofit. Uh, and that was a big milestone that took me about 11 years of work to get there. Um, that's a long path for everybody. And then I, I had an opportunity to come back to the Nature Conservancy as the Fire Learning Network Director. And that is, uh, I have an awesome job, honestly. I get to work with some of the best people in fire across the nation and really support those folks in doing the good work that they're doing on the ground. Um, and I can say a little bit more about, about that specifically in a bit. So what do I enjoy about fuels and fire? Um, I'm a nerd and I love working with other nerds and doing the ecological management and using fire as one tool is one part of that management to restore and maintain native ecosystems. So I love the science side of it. I love the intellectual challenge of fire management, of the planning, of the science, of the execution. But I also love the physical side of it. And fire is really compelling to me because it combines the intellectual and the physical challenge. I also really enjoy the people that I've gotten to work with over the years. Some of the smartest, funniest, most passionate and dedicated people I can ever imagine working with. Uh, 
all of them are smart enough to go do anything they want to do in life. And they choose to be here and do this work in sometimes rural places that are challenging to live in or under challenging circumstances and for maybe not a whole lot of pay, but they do the work because they really believe in it. Um, and that's really rewarding to work with people who are that dedicated to a cause that they feel matters. Um, and they're also just great people. Um, and this picture is from a prescribed fire training exchange in Nebraska. Many of these folks I met there for the first time and I still count them among my close personal friends. And then it's just fun, honestly. And I've gotten to go to some really beautiful, unique places that I never would have seen uh, or learned about otherwise. Um, Niobrara Valley Preserve in North Central Nebraska is one of them. Anytime I tell people, oh, this is a really cool place in Nebraska, they look at me like I'm crazy, that there can't possibly be anything that interesting in Nebraska. But honestly, it is one of the most beautiful places I've ever been and one of the largest intact native grasslands left in all of North America. So it's a really special place that I never would have known existed <laughs> if not for fire and land management. So these are the folks that I work with in the Fire Learning Network. Um, the FLN is 20 years old now. It's a project that is a partnership between the US Forest Service, the Nature Conservancy, and the Land Management Agencies of the Department of Interior. And essentially what we do is find really smart people who are working really hard on wildfire resilience in their place and we network them together with other people who are working in other parts of the country. So there are currently 15 regions and one in development across the United States from the central Appalachians uh, to the Southern Blue Ridge Mountains, Arkansas, Minnesota, Colorado, New Mexico, Washington, Oregon, California, Montana, and Idaho. So we cover a lot of different ecosystems a lot of different parts of the country, a lot of different states and political environments, you know, politics gets involved in fire as well. And we look for the common lessons, the lessons drawn from both success and from failure. And we share those lessons learned so that everybody can advance wildfire resilience in their place. Uh, this picture is from our annual workshop that we held in the Blackfoot Valley of Montana just this last October, these are some of the most spectacular change makers in wildfire resilience in the United States. They are awesome, they are fun. Uh, this event is really the highlight of the year. And I always come away from this feeling energized and ready to tackle all of the challenges again. So the people really is a big part of why I do this work and why I stay in this work. But there are challenges, of course. And uh, you know some of the challenges that I've encountered uh, all through my career, um, you know, in the early days, seasonal work is challenging. You know, finding those seasonal positions, making those rotations, finding the next job where funding is always limited. Uh, that can be really fun, but it can also be really tough. And, and it takes a lot. And it can be challenging to land that first full-time job and have the financial security, especially in the nonprofit sector. And I've spent most of my career in the nonprofit sector uh, where it's kind of a, a feast and famine situation uh, with funding. Uh, well, this is certainly not uh, limited to the nonprofit sector. Accessing training and career advancement can be really challenging as well. The Nature Conservancy is the only nonprofit that fully follows NWCG standards and uh, has access to IQCS and all of the federal systems for wildland fire. Uh, even so, it can be challenging for our staff to access NWCG trainings and then especially difficult to access the experiential learning that we need to get through our task books, particularly for wildfire tasks. The Nature Conservancy is nonprofit and we're focused on land management. Our mission does not include 
wildfire suppression in the same way that it does for federal agencies and state agencies. So for us, doing wildfire details is really about the training to advance our task books and our qualifications for prescribed fire and to further the mission of the Nature Conservancy. So it can be pretty tough. Uh, career advancement can be hard as well. You know, folks tend to stay in their positions for a really long time because they love it and they're dedicated to that place. So we have a lot of folks have to move around a little bit to find that place and their niche and their next step. Today, for me, I think the biggest challenges really revolve around um, burnout and mental health. And the two pictures I'm showing here, uh, for me, really resonate and illustrate that. And, and I'll explain what they are. The picture on the right is a picture of the East Troublesome Fire that burned on Colorado's Front Range a couple of years ago. This became the largest wildfire in state history and significantly impacted a number of communities up there. The Northern Colorado Fireshed Collaborative is an FLN region that's sort of loosely focused around Fort Collins to the Boulder area on the Colorado Front Range. So this was a really impactful wildfire for them. Similarly, on the left, this is a picture of the Slater fire that burned in the Mid-Klamath region of Northern California. Uh, these folks out on the Mid-Klamath have been members of the Fire Learning Network for a long time. They work in an extremely rural area with pretty limited resources and really challenging terrain. Uh, if anybody watching this has ever burned in Northern California, they know what I'm talking about and how steep those mountains are and how much poison oak there is. It's a pretty challenging place. And they've been working really hard to do proactive fuels and fire management work to get ahead of the big fires that they've experienced and that they know are still coming in their landscape. The Slater fire burned in an area where they had been pushing for years to do prescribed fire and had just met one challenge after another. And unfortunately, the Slater fire did uh, burn private residences. Some community members lost homes. It was really impactful. And the leaders that I work with there were heartbroken that they had not been able to get that work that they knew needed to happen done fast enough to prevent the negative impacts of this fire. And that's a reality a lot of places, especially in the West, but also in parts of the Appalachian Mountains and the Midwest and Great Plains as well. And that really takes a toll on our leaders. Uh, they're working as hard as they can, and sometimes it's not enough fast enough, and that's really hard for people. We are bringing increased attention in the Fire Learning Network to mental health, to managing for burnout, to work-life balance, and uh, supporting each other in community because of these challenges. And we need folks to, to be able to stick in the work and take care of themselves and uh, stay with us as we push toward doing more and more of this work in the face of really significant environmental and political challenges. So, uh, Things that you need for success. Um, I love these questions. And this was really hard to think about this. Uh, where, what buckets I would put these different things in. Uh, I think for knowledge, obviously ecology. Understanding ecology and ecological science is really important for doing prescribed fire and land management. When I was a land steward, when I was in the field managing preserves, mechanics was huge knowing how to fix things when they broke was a really important skill set and served me really well. Understanding weather patterns, both for fire and for general land management was super important. And then as I advanced in my career and I moved into supervisory roles and now being the director of the Fire Learning Network, What's become very clear to me is that systems thinking is important, understanding relationships between large scale systems uh, and knowing the industry, knowing the terms, knowing the relationships, knowing functional areas, um, how agencies are organized and why and some of the history behind that. And then finally, the human dynamics, uh, 
I think you've probably all heard that joke. Uh, I certainly heard it a lot in college where the professors would say like, look, this isn't about going out in the woods and, and doing work alone. This is about people and you're gonna be working with people and boy, were they right. Um, and my job today is mostly about working with people and it's about human dynamics and helping those people identify and overcome challenges. So having having some knowledge and training and experience around those things is really important. Yeah, and one thing to point out too, just since there's going to be some folks uh, watching that are just starting to get into fire, is a lot of that stuff will come uh, through the positions that you're in. You know, you don't have to come in with all of those either. Um, you're going to learn them on the job as part of as part of your career. Yes, absolutely. I can't say that I had systems thinking or human dynamics under my belt in my first position. That definitely came with time and, and with identifying that it was important and pursuing those skills and knowledge. So similarly, uh, problem solving, communication, physical ability, these were all things that I was working on very early in my career. Communication is important at every level and at every job. But as I advanced, uh, paying more attention to teaching skills, realizing that I was a teacher. Uh, when I became a supervisor, teaching the people who are reporting to me became a huge part of what I did. And focusing on those leadership skills and building emotional intelligence in myself and then supporting uh, the people around me when emotional intelligence became really important. In terms of attitudes, I think questioning is important, being really curious about everything. Uh, having an inclusive mindset, uh, inclusive of different people, different perspectives, different backgrounds in this work, that it really does take all of us and all kinds of different people to do wildfire resilience work. Fundamentally, being kind. Uh, there is a lot of hardship in the work uh, that I was talking about with mental health and being kind is really fundamental, I think, to, to being successful. Over time, uh, the kinds of perseverance and grit that I've needed in my jobs has shifted. You know, when I was in the field, when I was doing field work every day, I had to have grit to make it through a 12 hour day working in the heat and the dirt and the dust. Today, I have to have some grit to make it through eight hours of Zoom calls and dealing with uh, sometimes crazy bureaucracy and rules and policies that we're coming up against and working with different agencies and trying to bring a lot of different people together to do cross-border work. That takes a lot of perseverance, too, of a different kind. And then these are very similar. Um, I it, it thought it was a fascinating question to think about the, the skills that have developed in fire that serve me in life. Uh, you'll see it's a lot of repeat from the last side, but I can't emphasize the human dynamics piece of this enough that, uh, you know, I had three different calls today that all focused on the human dynamics of a particular challenge around doing cooperative or cross-border prescribed fire. Uh, our challenges are almost never, uh, or at least the most important challenges are not, in my opinion, the equipment and the weather. Those are bad enough. It's the human dynamics behind all of it that is the most challenging thing of all. And the thing that I've really um, worked on and learned over the years as, as my position, as my work has changed. I think that was the, oh no, here we go. One, I think this is the last slide now. Uh, so what I would say for getting a career in this uh, is really to know everyone. Um, I was naturally a shy person and introverted. And I realized really quickly, especially because I changed my career focus uh, late in pursuit of a bachelor's degree, I thought I was going to be a veterinarian. So I had built a network and knowledge focused on that. And then I changed I just set a goal of meeting everyone, knowing all the people in this field in the area around me and that they would know me. 
I showed up at everything. I volunteered for everything that I possibly could. Um, I went to all the workshops, all the webinars, all the meetings, and I really jumped into any of the opportunities that I could tackle. And I was willing to do whatever work needed to be done. Um, sometimes it's not glamorous. Uh, sometimes you just have to sweep the shop floor. And I've done a lot of sweeping the shop floor in my career. And I think uh, even more fundamental, be reliable, be curious, be kind, and be interested. And people will notice those characteristics. And in general, you know, still that, that list, be reliable, curious, kind, and interested is at the top of the list. But do the work, learn your craft, uh, and practice it to the best of your ability. Tend to your network. Um, it's not enough to, to meet someone once or twice. You have to always maintain those relationships, reintroduce yourself, say hello, just keep your face in front of them, essentially. It's all about networks. Uh, there's a reason that the, the work that I do, the Fire Learning Network, is called the Fire Learning Network. It's really a very pointed name and very accurate name. And then also, I can't stress enough, just maintaining a work-life balance that works for you. And that looks different for everyone, but the work does take perseverance and grit and cultivating a work-life balance that works, cultivating fun and play and time away for yourself early in your career will serve you really well. Um, I think not enough of us learned that early enough, and that might be my top piece of advice, is cultivate those good habits early. Well, I will stop sharing there. Um, and is the, the chat going to be available or uh, recorded as well? Um, it is not going to pop it as recorded, but if there's anything okay. significantly in the chat, then I can note it down. But um, I guess, first off, Quinn, do you have any questions? And if not, that's fine. I don't mean to throw you on the spot, but just since you're on here. <laughs> uh, not right now. I'll, I was thinking of something, but I haven't really fully put it together yet. I was just kind of taking down notes. Sounds good. No worries. I'll get back to you in a second. Cool. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Emily. That was some great stuff. Um, I had a couple that popped up that folks might ask about as we went. So um, can you touch a little bit more on that kind of component that you talked about as far as the love of fire versus the pay debate? Because when people are first mm -hmm. getting into their career, they're like, oh, this is more money than I've ever made. This is great. Um, you know, coming straight out of high school or college or something. Um, and it seems really great. And maybe, you know, very well could be. Um, but then, you know, farther you get into life, you're like, actually, maybe this isn't enough and, and that kind of thing. So can you kind of touch on why you think there's so many of us that do it anyway um, for that love of it? Yeah, that's a great question. Why do we do it? <laughs> um, I think I think it really is definitely for me, and I think this is true for a lot of the folks I work with, this call to do work that matters, that is impactful, whether you're coming at it from a love of nature and wanting to protect nature and restore nature, um, that ecological perspective, or for a lot of folks, they come into it because of the desire to serve and protect human communities. And I see a lot of the people I work with and that I support in the Fire Learning Network sort of come to a middle place where they're really passionate and dedicated to both sides of that mission. Um, and it really does become a calling that's hard to walk away from. Uh, I know that the pay issue is, is definitely in the news and front and center for federal and state agencies as well. And there's been some recent legislation to address that pay deficiency for federal agencies, which is wonderful. Uh, you know, the reality is a lot of these rural places that we have to live to do this work are pretty expensive to live in and the wages haven't kept up. So even folks who are really dedicated and passionate about this work just can't deal with that financial reality and have to step away, which is really unfortunate. We need all those people. We have a workforce shortage right now. Um, one of my coworkers, Jeremy Bailey, would say that we need 10,000 people working for 10 years 
to begin to address the prescribed fire deficit that we have just in the West. Uh, and we don't have anywhere close to 10,000 people right now. You know, I I can really speak more to the nonprofit side of things where uh, in the Nature Conservancy, we will invest for 10 plus years in employee and get them trained up to burn boss type two and then lose them to a federal agency because our wages are in some places even worse than the federal agencies. Um, and that really hurts. That's a huge investment to make in an employee and get them to RxB2 and then to lose them. The Nature Conservancy has taken some steps to address that as well. And hopefully we'll see that that pay um, even out. Uh, we had a seasonal crew member just write a great blog for us where he talked about the, the work being paid in sunsets. And uh, I really encourage you to read that. It, it really speaks to this issue and that tension between the work-life balance, the pay, you know, needing to be home for families and all their life priorities that really pulls people away from this work and that being paid in sunsets doesn't really pay the bills. Um, and yet it's so rewarding as well. So if you want to read that, um, go to firenetworks.org. That's our Fire Networks website. You can find out more about the Fire Learning Network and you'll see a link to our blog about that. And Elliot's a great writer. Um, I think you'll find that, that blog post compelling. Awesome. Yeah, that's great. Um, I hope that folks check that out. There's definitely, you know, podcasts and things out there about those kind of things too. So um, folks can check those out as well. Um, another thing that kind of just to spring off of that is maybe helping folks understand when it's time to maybe switch it up, whether that's like within your agency or maybe changing agencies and organizations, things like that, just how to know when it's time. Because especially when people are first getting into it, they're thinking like, oh, I'm going to be this specific thing and I'm going to do that forever. And so sometimes it's hard to recognize when it's time to switch it up. So can you touch on that for, for folks? Yeah, great question. You know, I what immediately comes to my mind is my decision to leave the Nature Conservancy. I was just shy of 10 years with the organization when I, I left to, to work for that other nonprofit as an executive director. And so I went from a land steward to an executive director. And that was a huge jump. I didn't do any like other director level positions in between. That was a big decision. Um, it took me out of the field very suddenly, and it was a hard transition. I really, I felt kind of lost initially, <laughs> and how do I do this work, and why did I make this choice? But as much as I loved being a land steward, and it might be the job that I am always most proud of in my career, because it is really where the rubber meets the road. It is a type of job where you are doing the work, you are holding the drip torch, Um I realized that I wasn't being challenged as much as I wanted to be, and I wasn't growing my skills. I still loved doing field work. I still loved being outside most days, but I felt a desire to also have a stronger voice in decision making and leadership and realize that I wasn't going to be able to build those skills in that particular position. Um, and so I, I made that jump. And like I said, it was a hard transition. I spent two and a half years in that role and self-identified that that was not where I wanted to be, that I actually wasn't the best fit for that organization and their particular priorities. And when the opportunity came up to uh, work with the Fire Learning Network in particular, that felt really exciting. And um I, I was actually looking at a couple different opportunities at the time. And when they made this job offer, I actually jumped up and down in my office and I thought, oh, I didn't realize I was that excited about this. Okay, that that's probably the right direction. That's where I need to go. So I think it's like, what's pulling you? You know, what puts some fire in your belly and pulls you with the opportunity? You know, go for it, chase that. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's, uh, you've kind of touched on this, but it's really important to go for one opportunities that uh, scare you a little bit sometimes because it's going to push you out of your box, uh, especially when you're 
kind of getting, you know, out of your first maybe couple seasonal jobs or that kind of thing, like making the push to full-time or switching jobs within your full-time position, that kind of thing that scare you a little bit because that's what's going to make you grow. And then also I had a mentor at one point that uh, said like your ideal position that's perfect for you probably doesn't exist yet. And I thought that was really interesting because it's these things that you have to build all those skills and your network and that kind of thing. And then those are going to become available, you know, the opportunity is going to present itself um, at the right time. So I thought that was interesting as well. Um, and just finding your niche yeah. and the right organization and that kind of thing. So it's a cool way to think of it too. Cool. All right. I'm just like looking at my notes here, seeing what else. And Quinn, if you think of something, feel free to hop in here with questions too. Uh, yeah. So my mom works for the uh, or she used to work for the National Park Service. So I've learned a little bit about like the um the benefits and stuff you can get from that. So I was kind of going to ask, like, what's the difference between federal and state and then um more like private nonprofit benefits that you can get from working? Yeah, good question. I'll do my best. Um, so federal agency benefits, from what I understand, and I've never worked for a federal agency, but from what I understand, they tend to be pretty good. There's a pretty good retirement system there. For primary fire jobs, it does depend on how many years you've been in the system. Uh, that's also true for a lot of state agencies. Uh, you won't reach your maximum benefits until you've put in a certain number of years. Something to be aware of for the federal system is for primary fire jobs, there's a mandatory retirement age. So I know one of my coworkers was had a decision point in his career. He had left the federal system to come work for the Nature Conservancy, and he realized if he didn't go back to the federal system by a certain age, he couldn't essentially go back um, because he wouldn't be able to, to have enough years in before that mandatory retirement. Depends on the job category, whether a position is subject to that mandatory requirement. Um, states really vary. Uh, there are some state agencies that I think pay pretty well, pretty uh, consistent, at least consistent with federal agencies. Other states do not. Uh, I work with some states in the South US where I understand that the pay is quite low and they have a lot of turnover <laughs> um, in their state agency because of that. Cal Fire, uh, California's state agency, is probably the best compensated, uh, both in salary and benefits. They have a union there that really advocates for those employees. I can speak best to the Nature Conservancy, and I would say that we are very fortunate because TNC is such a large organization. Our health benefits are really good. Uh, it covers a lot. We have dental and vision benefits. We have a 401k, the TNC matches up to 8%, which is high even for uh, the private sector. Um, I have friends who work in software or finance who don't get 8% matching on their 401k. So TNC, uh, our salaries are not always uh, what you would make in the federal system, but our benefits are really good. So they try to kind of make up for that a little bit. Um, we also have some, uh, you know, insurance type uh, coverage that's a little bit unusual. So when I went to that smaller nonprofit, I did not have the same kind of benefits. A lot of smaller nonprofits uh, aren't big enough to negotiate good health benefits. Um, so they struggle a little bit more in that realm. And if you're thinking about going into that area, definitely research what a particular organization can offer and know that it might not be uh, quite what you could find in the federal system in particular. Uh, one of the compensations for me uh, working in the nonprofit sector that makes up for some of those differences in pay and benefits is the flexibility and the ability to be creative. Um, TNC is big and it has enough bureaucracy as it is. But particularly on my team, I have a really supportive, really brilliant supervisor, and I work with really awesome people. And 
we have the freedom to say yes to things, to be creative and innovative and flexible. And that freedom I really value. And I think that makes up for me. I won't say this is true for everybody, but for me personally, it makes up for some of those differences in compensation. Great. Yeah, good note on that. And uh, it totally depends on where you're at, whether it's federal, state, private, any of that. Um, and another thing is a lot of uh, seasonal employees, depending on the agency, don't get benefits. So that's something to think about. That's why a lot of people end up converting to full time um, is to get those benefits. So things to weigh out kind of as you get into that point in your career. Um, I was going to ask, what are some of the smaller lessons that you have learned throughout your career that turned out to be more formative that than you thought originally, you know? So it's like small things that you didn't really think about much at the time. And then looking back, were like very formative for you, whether that's lessons or moments or mentors or anything like that. Oh, that's a great question. The big question, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Well, the one that really springs to mind, um, when I worked in Iowa, I used to go out to uh, a prescribed prayer training exchange in Nebraska every year and assist with that. And one year, we we just kept having a lot of challenges with equipment and personalities and um, burns just not, I mean, no burn ever goes 100% according to plan, but some were particularly challenging that year. And in thinking about all of the struggles, and it really came down to human dynamics again in a lot of ways, um, it really struck me that the leaders that I most respected and that I was learning the most from and wanted to emulate had what I think of as a servant model of leadership. They don't think of themselves as sitting at the top of the you know, pyramid-shaped org chart. They're not, you know, they don't strive to be at the top of the pile. The way they think about their leadership and their role is supporting the people who report to them. They think of themselves as smoothing the path. They want all the problems so that they can find solutions so that the people who are on the ground doing the work can do it easier and better and faster. Um, and I really started thinking about how strange it is that we draw org charts like this with, you know, the boss sitting at the top and all the people who hold the drip torch or, you know, hold the tools at the bottom. And I've really tried to think about it more like this, where those people are on top, a leader is holding all of those people, that that is all on your shoulders as the leader to make sure that those people have what they need to do the work that really matters. Um, and it was that one prescribed fire training exchange where it just yeah, servant leadership. I love that. Great. All right. Um, and then I guess just kind of one last thing that springs to mind off of that is that human dynamics component that you're so, um, that you've emphasized quite a bit is how do you think that changes kind of early mm -hmm. career to mid career? You know, it might start out like it's more crew dynamics that you see, you know, personnel and that kind of thing. But how do you think that evolves from sort of early to mid career? other than the leadership model you just talked about. Yeah, I, <laughs> yeah. yeah I, I think early career, it really is about crew dynamics. And um, I remember sitting through some leadership trainings in the past that were really focused on sort of corporate jobs in offices. And they were talking about relating to, you know, or having positive relationships with your coworkers or with your uh, direct reports or your supervisors. And I thought, boy, all of this is really different when you eat every meal and you sleep in the dirt next to these people that you might spend more time in a week with your coworkers than you do with your family. <laughs> and it's really different. Um, so that those human dynamics and, and being able to work with people when they're happy and excited and when they're mad and frustrated and give people grace for all of those human emotions. And then as I've advanced in my career, um, it's all of those things still apply because I still have a boss and direct reports and coworkers. We might not be you know, sleeping in the dirt next to each other every night anymore, but those relationships change and evolve. 
I, but now, especially, you know, working with the Fair Learning Network and seeing the, the burnout and the struggles that people are having and doing this work, what I have been learning and needing to embrace and be comfortable with is vulnerability and my own vulnerability, being able to admit when I don't know something, when I've been wrong about something, when something frustrates me or scares me or excites me even, by also holding space and being comfortable with other people's vulnerability and giving them grace to feel all the feels and uh, have their frustrations and uh, yeah, give room for all of that and hear all of that and then be able to set it aside and focus on what comes next and how are we going to get past that challenge that they're so frustrated or heartbroken by and moving from those negative emotions into the positive space. Um, that is not something that I ever saw coming. <laughs> That's not something that I put myself back in, in my early positions, didn't see it. And now it's it's almost my daily reality to support people through those things and um, at least be shoulder to shoulder with them in those challenges. Absolutely. I completely agree. Um, I think that's something that's sort of tough to understand. Uh, a lot of the time we talk about this work-life balance, but uh, especially if you're still kind of in the crew part of your career or whatever that looks like, uh, your work-life balance, a lot of the time is all in one place kind of happening at the same time, right? You're getting phone calls while you're out on fires and that kind of thing. And so um, trying to balance those out when they are separate, but they also intertwine so much is really important. So when you get more into supervisory roles, that's really important to kind of think about how, um, you know, people's home lives affect uh, what they're doing on the job and vice versa, because that's a, a big thing, you know, big toll to carry sometimes. So I appreciate you touching on that. Um, and then I think I thought of one last question and then we'll kind of see if Quinn has anything else and then anything else for you to close out on. But what do you see as uh, some of the Fire Learning Network's like really big wins that you've witnessed that you're proud of, whether it's you personally or just other folks that's within the organization, but. Yeah, well, that's, yeah, that's a great question. Um, big wins, there's so many. Uh, I, I mean, they so could be privileged. small wins too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, well, I'll, I'll give some big ones and some small ones, I think. Uh, I am so privileged to just be the latest director of the Fire Learning Network. And I can look back on 20 years of hard work and all my predecessors leadership. Uh, the emergence and the growth of the Prescribed Fire Training Exchange Program, TREX. Um, my coworker, Jeremy Bailey, started that as part of the Fire Learning Network. It spun out into its own program of work and now is all over the world um, and a highly recognized term. And I couldn't be more proud of that and that innovation. Um, there are various other federal programs uh, that have spun out of the FLN. The FLN was an innovator in the early days and is still leading in supporting collaborative fire management, collaborative wildfire risk reduction all across the nation. And that's uh, really awesome to see. We have folks putting fire on the ground in really difficult places. Um, New Mexico, California, uh, the FLN facilitated a learning exchange between prescribed fire associations in the Great Plains in Northern California, where the PBA model, this is landowner led prescribed fire implementation was not happening like that in California. And after that learning exchange, uh, there has been almost ex exponential growth in California of that and private landowners are doing incredible work, leading the way in a state that has really suffered some really negative impacts. And there's a lot of fear and anxiety around fire in general, understandably, but they're going and getting it done. And then I think, yes, yeah, so those, those are some big ones. Uh, small ones, I think we really bring a focus on people and relationships and centering that work. I've been repeating human dynamics all through this, right? But it begins and ends with relationships. And 
the philosophy of showing up and saying yes when someone asks for help uh, or you come into a collaborative space, show up and say yes. And, uh, you know, there's always that common ground in that space. Um, so we, we really endorse that philosophy and we see that approach in all of the places where the greatest successes are happening. And I'm talking about that like it's a small thing and it it's kind of a small thing. It feels like a small thing until you think about the collective impact of that. That is actually a really huge thing. Absolutely, little things make up big things. That's it. There is no big lever that we can pull to just fix wildfire issues across the United States. It is all the people doing the work in their place, all that collective effort, that's what's changing our trajectory in this work. Awesome. Lynn, do you have anything left to ask Emily? Or are you good? <laughs> uh, yeah, I actually had a question for you. Um, so Emily talked about um, showing up and you know getting experience anywhere possible. So what would be like some local options for doing that? I've heard about the the safe club that Heather runs here, but what are maybe some other options that I could do to gain some experience? Yeah. Um, so I'm actually remote, so I'm not in Idaho. So Heather's the one to really talk to about like actual localized options. But um, the training exchange burns, those happen all over the place uh, in Idaho um, and states around there. Um, anywhere there there's prescribed burn associations so heather runs one of those um and so they put on some great meetings and events that you're always welcome to sit in on and learn um could keep going on and on but there's quite a few uh just workshops like virtually that you can take um to be able to keep gaining experience and that sort of thing um and emily feel free to hop in here if you think of something else as well <laughs> oh perfect no, yeah. i think that that safe club is great. I've worked with Heather and the safe club members, um, particularly in Nebraska, but I know they've gone all over the US. Um, so I put this in the chat for you, Quinn, but for others, if you can't see the chat, firenetworks.org will have a list of all of the prescribed fire training exchanges that we're aware of anyway, happening across the US and across the world. Um, Sometimes uh, those opportunities will offer some financial support or at least fee waivers, uh, sp you know, sometimes specifically for students and for folks who aren't sponsored by their employer to attend. So definitely check those out. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, yeah, definitely keep an eye on like safe events, and things like that. Like you mentioned, uh, I was a part of that when I was uh, in school still in California. And that was one of the great um kind of benefits to being a part of SAFE was doing checks and things like that, going to conferences. Heather right now is at an AFE conference in Monterey. Um, and so SAFE students are eligible to go to that for that. Um, that's an example of those. So yeah, just kind of building upon that network like we talked about. And then you're going to hear about more and more. And I'm sure as soon as we get off this call, I'm going to think about so many other resources. So <laughs> if so, I'll try to throw some more your way. But um, yeah, the more people you talk to, the more exposure you're going to get to things like that yeah Sweet. even if you're near um if you're near uh, a nonprofit's office or a state or a federal agency most of the time or a lot of the times folks will take volunteers uh, that's actually how i got my foot in the door of the nature conservancy is that i volunteered and then i they knew me so when it came time to hire seasonal employees i was kind of i don't know if i was first in line but they knew who i was and that's a big deal <laughs> Um, so yeah, just showing up and, and meeting all of those kinds of people, just not being afraid to knock on the door and say, Hey, I'm here. I'm interested. What can I help with? Absolutely. I completely agree. Perfect. Well, is there anything else, Emily, that you wanted to kind of touch on or things that you wanted to reemphasize or anything like that before we finish up? No, I think all I could say to, to wrap up is that there's so many different avenues that you can take, um, whether it's prescribed fire or wildfire, different agencies, different um, places to work and things to focus on. And 
we need a workforce. We need all kinds of different people from all kinds of different backgrounds and perspectives doing all aspects of this work. And uh, especially if you're looking right now for job opportunities, I think it's a pretty good time. The agencies are hiring, the Nature Conservancy is hiring. Um, again, if you go to that firenetworks.org or, or natureconservancy.org slash careers, uh, we are posting as needed burn crew member positions um, all the time. And some of those positions are six months, some of them are two weeks. So even if you only have a little bit of time, there might be a good opportunity for you in there. But uh, there's a lot happening, a lot of money in the sector right now, and we're really trying to build that workforce. Yeah. And just to build on that, too, there's on-call crews for agencies, for private companies, all that kind of thing, um, OC crews, on-call crews. So that's a great way to start gaining experience, too, just to kind of build off on your previous question. Cool. All right. Well, thank you so much, Emily, for joining us. Thanks, Quinn, for hopping on as our sole student in here uh, today. <laughs> and uh, yeah, we'll be uh, posting this recording. And Emily, I can always send you a, a link to that if you decide you want it to link anyone else or anything like that. But uh, thank you so much for joining us and taking the time. Yeah, thank, yeah, you. thank you. It was a pleasure. Thanks. Yeah, thank you so much. Have a good one. You too.